Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another edition of Johnny's Ambassadors Expert Webinar Series for Parents. We have another incredible guest with us today, whom I will introduce uh, in just a moment. Uh, Johnny's Ambassadors was founded after our son Johnny died by suicide in November of 2019 after using high potency marijuana dabs. And we now educate parents and teens about the dangers of using today's marijuana on adolescent brain development, mental health, and suicide. And our guest today will be speaking directly to that topic. Uh, this session is being recorded. You can please share uh, this recording with others if you are watching it. Um, Dr. Smith has provided two handouts to you today, a copy of his slides as well as another PDF, which he will discuss, and those are in your control panel under the section that says handouts. Uh, stay on your toes because we're going to do a couple polls today. We have several polls that we will be asking you to click on your screen and answer. So we'll do those throughout to keep you engaged. So please participate in those. And lastly, at the end of uh, today's webinar, Dr. Smith will reserve a few moments for questions. So as we go, so you don't forget those, please type them into the question box. And then I will come back on and read those to Dr. Smith in the order they were received. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bobby Smith, who is a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist who has acted as clinical lead across three adolescent addiction services in Dublin for over 14 years. He is a clinical senior lecturer with the Department of Public Health and Primary Care in Trinity College, Dublin. He has published over 75 scientific papers in the field of addiction. His PhD thesis examined strategies to reduce the harms arising from substance abuse by youth. He is co-author of the book, Adolescence and Substance Abuse, the Handbook for Professionals Working with Young People. He has been a member of the National Advisory Committee on Drugs and Alcohol. Bobby, thank you so much for being one of Johnny's ambassadors. Thank you, Laura. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm really privileged to be now one of Johnny's ambassadors and talking about a topic that's become very dear to my heart uh, in terms of uh, adolescent cannabis use. Um, and to some extent, it actually surprises me that I've ended up at this point um, where cannabis has become such a focus of my clinical work which started in the area of adolescent addiction treatment back in 2003, uh, at which stage cannabis wasn't a big concern for the, the, the young people I was seeing. But unfortunately, it's become now the dominant substance that's causing adolescents in Dublin and indeed across Ireland to seek out addiction treatment. And I know that, that uh, similar issues have been encountered globally. Um, so what I was going to try and touch on today is just to briefly remind ourselves, I suppose, um, why it is we worry about adolescents using cannabis, uh, why as parents it's something we're concerned about and I suppose are doing our best to, to keep a lid on. Um, I know you've had numerous previous talks on that particular topic, so I'm not going to dwell massively on the harms. Uh, I'm probably going to spend the bulk of the time really trying to talk about the second point, which is about just parenting strategies, um, you know, which which will facilitate sort of prevention. Uh, ideally, what maximizes the likelihood that, that a teenager heads down this path in the first place. And that's largely drawn, uh, drawn from what we understand about what works in terms of substance use prevention generally, alcohol. Uh, prevention and so on from a parental perspective. Um, I'll sort of touch on the fact that, that I'm conscious of the fact most people listening today are in the United States where you're operating in quite a different social context to that which exists in Ireland. In Ireland, cannabis is uh, an illegal drug. There's no, there's no regulated access to it and the medical access program is tremendously restricted at the moment. So. Uh, it's really nothing like where you're at in the United States. Uh, and that presents challenges, perhaps in both locations, uh, which are different, I'll touch on those. And then finally, I was going to talk a little bit about 
our work with parents where young people have developed uh, a cannabis use disorder or a very problematic cannabis use and how it is we go about trying to support those parents in supporting their son or daughter in getting back on track again. And Laura, I suppose in terms of the, the first little survey, uh, it might be good to do that now over the next couple of minutes. Just it'll help me okay. get a sense of um, what's caused people to be interested in hearing the talk today. And I can, I can. Uh, okay, can super. Share. So I put that up on the screen here, Bobby. If everyone would please click on the statement which best describes why you are here today. Do you want to prevent problems with your child? Do you suspect your child is using substances? Do you know your child is using substances? Is your child using substances and seems addicted? Or are you here to just learn more about teenage cannabis use? If you could please click on the appropriate option, we can give Dr. Smith some guidance on that. We'll give everybody just a few more seconds. Okay, it looks like 80% have voted. All right, so let's close that and share that 8% want to prevent, 4% uh, no, 28%, oh wow, said using and seem addicted, and then Bobby, 60% are here to learn more about okay. teenage cannabis use. Okay, um, so hopefully the bulk of those topics in that list of goals there are reasonably relevant to, to most most participants. Um, okay, that's helpful, Laura. Thank you. Uh, so moving on, as Laura mentioned, uh, with my the team I work with at, at our service here in in Dublin, we we wrote a book a number of years ago, just looking at broadly at adolescents and substance use, which do, deals with alcohol and drugs. It's more targeted at. Um, professionals, I suppose, who are working with young people than it is targeted at families or parents, but, you know, there's perhaps something in it for uh, anyone. Okay, so for, first of all, maybe to think about, you know, who teenagers are, uh, the journey that they're on, and I suppose the way I view adolescents now is that they are apprentice adults, and thinking about them in that way, um, I think, allows us as parents, as the adults around them, figure out our role in guiding them on that journey. Um, you know, at the age of 10 or 12, kids are entirely dependent on mum and dad to manage their worlds, for them to solve every problem that they encounter. By the time they get to 20, we hope that they're able to largely stand on their own two feet. That they've picked up competencies or skills along the way that, that allow them to reach that point. Um, and they grow in confidence as they become more competent and capable as well, and they get more autonomy and independence. With that comes, I suppose, both more rights or autonomy and freedom, but equally uh, uh, there's an incremental expectation that they take responsibility for themselves and behave in a responsible way that's, that's uh, mindful of, of those around them, but perhaps also mindful of their own futures. I do think in modern Western countries, probably the primary responsibility that 16 year olds have is actually to their 18 year old self. You know, they're not burdened with the responsibility of, of generating income to pay for food for their six year old brother, um, um, as might have been the case uh, 100 years ago or indeed in some other cultures. So the responsibilities are there, but they're, they're different perhaps than was the case in previous generations. Um, so that conceptualization of adolescent development, but it's really a, a process of, of social skills acquisition to allow people to function as an adult, um, um, doesn't ignore the fact that what's happening inside their heads. So their brain is developing and changing as well. And indeed those changes within the brain are actually facilitating uh, young people in moving into a more autonomous, independent um, uh, version of themselves to, to embrace the challenges of adulthood. So the brain develops in this back to front, bottom to top type manner with the prefrontal cortex being the last bit of the brain to sort of fully mature and develop. And it's the prefrontal cortex, that's the part of the brain that's involved in complex problem solving that allows people extrapolate from past experience to apply it to some current problem to think through what will happen if I do A versus B versus C and to make, uh, I suppose, wise and sensible decisions. But it's the last bit of the brain to fully develop and that doesn't occur until the 
early or mid twenties. Um, okay, so that's my introduction to adolescence. Then uh, one of the challenges or possibilities that lie in front of young people as they venture into the world of adolescence is to contemplate moving into the world of substance use. And the diagram here, I suppose, just depicts my, uh, my um, version or my view on how that journey can work out. So people all start off in the top left hand corner there in the blue zone as having never used. So, and this diagram works just as well for cigarettes as it does for crack cocaine. Some people will leave the never used category and maybe experiment with the substance, move into the, the purple zone there of some recent use. Many people, no matter what the substance is, and I mean, it certainly applies to drugs like cannabis. Some kids try it, they just don't like its effects and they quickly become an ex-user. Others will continue to use very occasionally, perhaps if they're just hanging out with, the, with a particular group of friends or in a particular context. Others will go on to more sustained patterns of use and become a current user. And a proportion of those will then develop what we call a substance use disorder. So that red zone on the bottom um, is, uh, stands for substance use disorder. Uh, society and parents um, and so on tries to intervene in that potential journey in a number of locations. Uh, so initially, uh, I suppose in the background we have all these rules, regulations and laws um, which differ from country to country, but ultimately they're trying to delay onset of use um, or potentially uh, for drugs that are illegal to stop use altogether. And they have variable impact. Um, there's also then primary prevention, which is sort of uh, education-based programs, often based in schools, uh, but oftentimes complemented or supported by what's happening in the home, within communities and so on, where you're trying to instill in young people, I suppose, a set of values um, and uh, knowledge uh, that will cause them to be less likely to venture into the world of drug use. Secondary prevention then is, is, is uh, steps that we take to try and stop people progressing to more problematic or sustained patterns of use. Again, can also happen in a school setting. Um, but in healthcare, then we'll work with people who do report use and often engage what's called a brief intervention to have a conversation with a person about their substance use. And usually the goal there is to try to nudge it uh, towards a, a less frequent or potentially uh, complete cessation of use uh, direction. Um, and then we have treatment and treatment historically used to have the goal of working with people who had very significant levels of substance use and then the goal historically was always one of abstinence. But over the last sort of 10 or 20 years or, or so, uh, more treatment services now uh, accept additional goals um, and that including the services I work in where not everyone wants to stop and completely end their relationship with substance use. So you'll establish some intermediate goal which can potentially involve reductions in use. And obviously, once those reductions in use are achieved, you're continuing to have conversations uh, with uh, the young person to build incrementally on that. And I suppose our ambition obviously is that people would cease use, but not everyone achieves that goal. Um, just flicking back to that, I suppose parents fit into that potential uh, pathway uh, at multiple locations. They're involved in you know, prevention, they're involved in stopping curtailing progression, and also uh, they're key partners with us in terms of the treatment that we provide for young people with significant substance use problems. Um, so um, the focus of, of uh, this is to talk this morning is uh, on cannabis uh, and rates of use vary a lot from country to country. So the graph here depicts the SPAD survey data. So I know in the United States you've got a survey called Monitoring the Future, uh, which looks at 10th grade students, so 16 year olds in Europe. We interview them. They've, that study's been occurring uh, in lots of European locations over the last uh, 25 years or so. And we see in Ireland actually that rates of self-reported use were, were higher in the mid-1990s, but that was hash, uh, was the form of cannabis used back then, which was much lower potency. Um, what's used now is, is higher potency um, herbal cannabis. Um, Iceland is a country I really like. That's there at the, at the bottom of the, the graph in black, 
where they started off with pretty low rates of use back in the 1990s, and they've actually managed to get it even lower. Uh, the typical rates of pass month use in the United States are more in the, for this age range, are more in the 20% the plus zone. Uh, and that's sort of uh, demonstrated in this particular slide, which looks, uh, it's part of from the, from the Global Burden of Disease Survey, and it's accessible online, and it looks at the uh, amount of harm across society related to cannabis use disorders in young people aged 10 to 24 and how those rates vary uh, across the world. But you'd see lots of red there in North America, with Canada actually as a country sort of leading the way in terms of the, the rates of harm, but there's pockets of significant uh, levels of, of excess harm in the United States. Um, and that's borne out to some extent by your own Monitoring the Future uh, survey, which, as I mentioned, looks at 10th grade students, ask them about their cannabis use, and then ask them about the, for those who report cannabis use, and ask them about the frequency of cannabis use. And back in 1991, when the survey started, 0.8% uh, of 16 year olds or 15 year olds in 10th in grade said they'd use cannabis on a daily basis. Uh, unfortunately, in the latest survey, in, it's actually in 2000. Now there's a more recent survey, it's 4.4% it's now. So it's a five-fold increase in the number of uh, 10th grade students in the United States over the last 30 years who say they're using cannabis on a daily basis. In Europe, our rates are pretty much where yours were uh, back in the early 1990s. It's about 0.8%, or one in every 120 16-year-olds smoking cannabis on a daily basis. So what that graph says to me is that in Europe, you know, it's definitely some, some degree of problematic use, um, way more frequent than you'd want in that age range, but we've managed to sort of keep a bit of a lid on it, whereas in the United States, you've clearly gone in a different direction, and the rates of use are, to my eyes, pretty alarming. Um, okay, so yeah, the Monitoring the Future survey, it doesn't just in, it, it survey 10th grade students, it surveys people from 8th to 10th to 12th grade, and across those, uh, all those grades, the average is, it's 4.1% of US teens using cannabis daily, that's 850,000 uh, children using cannabis on a daily basis, uh, and an awful lot more than was the case back in 1991. What surprises me is that there isn't more uproar in medical journals uh, from the United States, you know, calling this out as a as a major public health crisis, um, and trying to understand that. Um, you know, I, I wonder is it just the the, the power and resources of those driving the legalization agenda are able to sort of drown out uh, those voices expressing concern. Uh, and there's also, I suppose, the, the, the reality in the states that you do perhaps, where well, you do certainly have a bigger public health challenge in the domain of drug use in terms of your opioid e epidemic. Uh, but certainly that level of daily cannabis use across the population uh, should be a big worry. Because like all drugs, cannabis use can cause harms. And these harms vary a little bit from substance to substance. So there they can be a, acute effects, which are sort of, when I say acute, that means short term. Things that happen you know, within minutes or hours of use. Um, and then there's more chronic effects, which are the longer term impacts on the person uh, who's using a drug with regularity over a period of time. And, those harms fall into a range of domains. I suppose that there can be impairments in social functioning, both in the short and medium term, <clears throat> damage to relationships. Um, some people can get a bad, a bad reaction in the short term uh, to whatever substance they've consumed. And obviously with repeated use over time, uh, most substances uh, have the potential to cause addiction and certainly cannabis does. Um, we, when we do sort of national surveys, it seems to be about one third of people who use cannabis with regularity. That's one third of people who are smoking cannabis sort of on a weekly or monthly basis will report symptoms consistent with a, a significant substance use disorder. Others can run into uh, mental health problems. So there's this range of harms that can come with cannabis use. There's obviously some people though smoke, smoke cannabis and they get away with it. It doesn't actually really cause them any major difficulty. What we do know in terms of these harms is that they're most likely to occur where use starts at a young age, as in in the teenage years, 
where use is more frequent if they're using on a daily basis as opposed to maybe just you know once a week on a Saturday night. Um, and if they're smoking more potent cannabis. And the potency of cannabis has changed remarkably over the last uh, few decades. Um, and I think is and that, 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 that increase in potency has accelerated further actually with legalization. It seems to me that the most potent cannabis uh, in, the, in the world seems to be available in Colorado with legalization. There is this issue of harm to others and it often gets uh, conversations about cannabis and the pros and cons of different policy options. Because the harms that are individual person using has an addiction and happens to be a parent impact on their parenting. Um, and uh, the teenager, I mean, the parents who attend our service just talk about the levels of aggression and violence that they see linked to their, their son or daughters, and it's usually a son's cannabis use. And so families are impacted as well. Um, and this slide just looks at our own service, which is the Youth Drug and Alcohol Service. We call it sort of Yoda for short. But um, cannabis is very much now the main drug for people to seek out addiction treatment in the adolescent age range in Dublin across Ireland. It's the main drug for about 70% of attendees. Vastly alcohol, which again may come as a surprise um, for those of you in the States, given that Ireland does have a well-deserved reputation of having bit of a, a, an alcohol problem but in this adolescent range you know we see seven or eight young people with uh, cancer problems for every one we see with alcohol and that's not because the guard or our police force here are um, directing uh, uh, hundreds of young people uh, towards treatment. Uh, criminal justice referrals account for a very small portion of our, of our referrals 10 percent or so um, and actually, they're just as likely to occur with alcohol as they are with, 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 uh, with drug use because uh, kids who drink a lot tend to fall foul of the law pretty regularly. Um, so one of the things we do, well, one of the things I've often tried to do is try to explain to people that adolescent addiction is real. Um, these young people that we're seeing are not the worded well. They, they really are describing how their substance use has taken control of their lives. It's become just like, you know, everyone sort of knows and understands what alcohol dependence is or cocaine dependence is, but a lot of us really struggle to get our heads around the fact that cannabis can cause people to be trapped in that same cycle of drug seeking, drug using, um, relentless focus on drug use to the exclusion of other activities. Um, and in the face of 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 ongoing problems that you know, people then you know sort of struggle to, to stay so they lose control of relationship not everyone does obviously but certainly a significant proportion too bobby may yeah. i interrupt you for just a moment if you will can we turn off your webcam for a time um, we're getting uh quite a patchy reception uh over turn here and i think webcam. that may help with the transmission Okay, oh. off my right now. Let's try that? that. Yes. Let's okay. see if we can hear you better. Okay. And we'll try to, we yeah. can try to put it back on later. Okay, no problem. Hopefully there, that's working with that. Thank you. Is it? Okay. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I hope you didn't miss too much. So this is again, just another comment from one of the, the young girls attending our service with a, a cannabis use disorder. And she's just describing how um, her substance use just sort of took over her life, squeezed out other things. Um, and in spite of the problems it was causing, she just found herself trapped in that cycle. I use these, um, you know, uh, book titles and uh, movie titles from 1950s anti cannabis propaganda um, alongside these slides for a reason, because, you know, I use these uh, uh, pictures um, as examples of to do prevention work badly, to exaggerate um, harms and risks and to apply to people that everyone who heads down a path of cannabis use, it'll lead you to a life of ruin and debauchery. And that was certainly, I would have viewed that view as laughable back 10 or 15 years ago. But what does really strike me is about the young people I'm meeting now is that they are describing a relationship with this drug that 
that you know isn't a million miles away from from that in those uh, caricature anti-cannabis propaganda books and movies from 50 60 years ago um okay um so this is from another paper again more uh comments from young people that came from some of the qualitative research that we did and again highlighting i suppose the this connection between parents and substance use in in the first quote there it's just how a young person's journey into cannabis use was perhaps a little bit influenced by his 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 dad's cannabis use and that's sort of perhaps positive connection uh, that he linked with him and the second quote is just i suppose a young person describing the amount of of acrimony that their uh, cannabis use uh, and the problems related to it was generating within the family home uh, as well. Um, this is a comment from a parent um, who's just talking about the mess uh, and problem, challenge, and difficulty that that adolescent cannabis addiction brought into her home. And again, highlighting the harm to others, that the fact that it didn't just impact the parent, it didn't impact links who are well. Um, I wonder, so one of the biggest worries for me as a psychiatrist is mental health consequences and the number of young people admitted to psychiatric hospitals in, with a cannabis diagnosis has increased sort of three to fourfold over the last 15 years. And I guess a round of relatively flat rates of use. So for me, the explanation for that is the arrival of the cannabis that we've seen over the last 10 or 15 years. And oddly enough, we've seen a significant increase in people admitted to medical hospitals with a greater magnitude. Um, indeed, uh, I think uh, that that's my next survey, um, um, Nora, which is okay. a question about what drugs cause yeah. uh, the most Let's psychiatric admissions. Here. Um, and this is. The question is, if everyone will uh, ask, uh, uh, click on your response, which category of drugs causes the largest number of admissions to psychiatric hospitals? What is your guess? Opioids, such as heroin or uh, pills, cannabis or cocaine? Let's see what everyone has to say on this, Bobby. We've got about... 70% who have voted. We'll give it just another a couple of seconds. We're getting a bit of a lag on your slides, Bobby, but I think it has uh, it has caught up. If we continue to struggle, I could run them from here, so I'll keep you posted. But we have about another uh, 15 minutes before questions. Okay, I will close that and share the results. All right, 10% said opioids, 81% say cannabis, and 10% say cocaine okay well there was probably a, a clue in the focus of today's conversation and maybe why i asked the question is, is that the answer is cannabinoids so uh, the your the audience is correct um and i guess that's not because cannabis is maybe more inclined to cause mental health problems than cocaine but it's just cannabis is way more widely used um but it's it's miles ahead of cocaine uh, indeed, sort of. I've looked; at those figures are from a couple of years ago. But the more recent data, I think, cannabis-related admissions in 2019 exceeded all of those related to uh, opioids, cocaine, and other stimulants combined. Um, uh, I know Laura uh, touched on uh, the, her own son's uh, death. And after I began speaking about cannabis, a father reached out to me. Um, um, just to talk about his his son's passing as well, uh, again, uh, suicide. Um, and just the, the the mental health difficulties that he witnessed uh, and struggles that he witnessed uh, for his son over the years beforehand. So while uh, fatal outcome is very unusual, um, uh, sadly, there are uh, certain a proportion of young people who, who um, for, for whom life just, just gets so difficult that, that this becomes a path that they uh, proceed down. 
Um, come back to the issue of the, the harm to others and the impact on family, um, and I will return to this in a while, but um, the uh, we, we tend to think of cannabis as a chill out drug and for, for lots of people who use it, particularly those who, who just use it very infrequently, that might be their experience of it. But the most common problem that parents report to us attending our service in connection with their children is anger, aggression, threats. And oftentimes that's not seen outside the home. So, so uh, as well as parents maybe having issues around feelings of, of, of shame and and failure uh, and grief at, 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 at you know where what cannabis has has done to their child is also sort of a sense of embarrassment about the the, the degree of of aggression uh, that they're having to deal with and, and a secrecy that surrounds itself around that uh, which causes parents to feel particularly trapped so this uh, approach uh, that we've adopted this article refers to called non-violent resistance is one that we work with parents around who are in that type of situation to try and give them the skills to rebuild connection with their sons, um, while also exerting positive influence on, on their son's decision making in terms of drug use and uh, uh, threatening behaviour. So there is this big list of potential risks. These are the reasons why we as parents, why we as, as clinicians, why a society, I suppose, worries about kids venturing into the world of cannabis use at a, at a young age. Um, this worry about impact on brain development, Mary Cannon will have spoken about that a couple of weeks ago, but the impact on IQ, um, there's the, the, this potential to, to develop sort of later problems. People who start using substances at a young age are more likely to develop problematic substance use as adults. Um, People can have adverse short-term reactions, impact on mood. Obviously, people are expecting or hoping for a positive one, but it can often be negative. Uh, and other stuff gets squeezed out. As drug use becomes a bigger part of a young person's life, the other positive stuff gets squeezed out. And it's that other positive stuff that gives young people the opportunity. Again, this idea of apprentice adults. So we're trying to pick up the skills for uh, to become a, a, a competent, functioning adult. Uh, but if, uh, if adolescents have been dominated by, by weed juice, they're missing out on the learning opportunity that it provides to pick up, um, I suppose, a range of positive coping skills. Okay, so um, maybe that's all a little bit negative. It's important to keep in mind that that change can happen. And Iceland is a country that I think lots of us should take inspiration from. Their rates of plasma and cannabis use were actually never particularly high, but they've managed to get them even lower, while the rest of Europe has on average been trending up over the last 20 years. So this past month, cannabis use, they're now down as low as about 2% of their 16-year-olds who've reported any cannabis use in the past uh, month. Again, in the States, uh, the figures are more in the 20% across different states, and indeed sure it's nearly 5% or 4% anyway, or double that number, who are using cannabis on a daily basis. Uh, whereas in, in Iceland, that's the number who are only using even once a month. Um, and as well, you know, in the United States, you've achieved stunning things in terms of uh, turning kids away from cigarette smoking. Uh, it's fallen by 90% in the last 30 years. Uh, so it shows that change can happen. And it also shows that change can happen even in the context of a legal regulated uh, substance. Um, so it's really important to retain some sense of optimism about society's ability to exert influence over the choices young people are making. And, optimism about our potential to exert influence as parents. And Iceland um, has really achieved wonderful things in multiple domains. They've dramatically reduced their teenage smoking. They've kept their cannabis low and got it even lower. Uh, teenage drunkenness was a huge issue in Iceland back in the mid-1990s and is now uh, actually pretty much the lowest level in Europe. So they've achieved pretty stunning things. Um, and they've done that by looking at risk and protective factors across the population of adolescents and really try to put in place scaffolding and supports around young people, scaffolding and supports around families, around schools, to try and uh, support young people in remaining on a more pro-social, productive and ultimately more fulfilling path and away from uh, the, the world of, of, of substance use. Uh, and that's had really positive impacts on their sporting performance, actually, as a country as well. Their soccer team, despite the fact they're a tiny country, 400,000 people, they 
they've qualified for the European Championships in soccer. Um, okay, so uh, one of the um, handouts that you should have in your pack there is called the Developmental Assets. Uh, it's 40 developmental assets. It was put together by researchers in the United States. And rather than focusing on risk factors, what they tried to do was look at what are the factors present in young people's lives where those young people demonstrate low rates of, of problematic behavior, low rates of aggression, low rates of substance use, low rates of, of depression problems across a whole different range. And they identified 40 assets. Uh, that they felt to be important. And they're in that one page handout. Um, what's, what the research then uh, demonstrated is that young people who had 10 or fewer of those assets exhibit very high rates of problems, but not universally present, of course. Uh, and young people who are fortunate enough to, to have 30 or more of the 40 assets, you don't need 40 out of 40, 30 is plenty. Uh, they exhibit low rates of, of the, those adverse outcomes. So what are the assets? I'll just, I'll really, they're pretty self-explanatory. I'm conscious of time and I, I'm going to put myself under time pressure, so I'm not going to talk too much about them. But they divide it up into internal assets, which are sort of personality characteristics or qualities of a young person that are intrinsic to them, that have maybe been nurtured by parents in school, but they're not ones we can just put in place. Um, you wake up and tomorrow on Saturday morning to decide, okay, I'm going to you know, foster or put that internal asset in place. These are things that, that uh, some kids are sort of born with, others are nurture over a period of time. Um, so the internal assets, they include things like um, uh, being focused on achievement, um, having some sense of importance of school and connection to school, having positive values, the things that most cultures try to encourage in young people, a sense of integrity, taking personal responsibility, uh, uh, placing some value on restraint. You don't just do something because it's going to provide some short-term fun or excitement. Uh, you're able to factor in longer-term consequences. And kids who are just blessed to have better social competencies, they're more organized, they're better at thinking problems through, they're better at building and forming friendships. These are all big advantages for young people. And it's good to have a positive sense of identity. I'm not a leaf blowing in the wind. I have some ability to influence the sort of day I'm having today, the sort of future I might have tomorrow. So it's good to have a positive sense of identity. But what's more important perhaps for today's discussion are the external assets, the things that, that we as adults can put in place. So young people who say they live in homes and in communities where they feel supported, they have a good connection with family, there's good communication, there's perhaps other key adults, it might be a grandparent, it might be the soccer coach, but there's other people who are there that they feel are, are, are sort of out there providing support for them. And it's good to feel and live in a community where young people feel valued, um, where there's some expectation that they participate in the community. They're given the opportunity to take on roles and, and even better if they actually avail of those opportunities. There's also the, the other side of family and community life, which is this issue of, of boundaries, rules, monitoring. And those things are, are of similar importance. Um, number 15 is interesting, this is positive peer influence. We tend to view peer pressure and peer influence in a negative way. If, you're, if you've got the right bunch of peers, they can exert a very positive influence on you. Um, and that, brings me to this idea of scaffolding. Psychologists talk about scaffolding around young people and parents provide that to some extent around the parent, there's the wider family, around the family, there's the community, around the community, there's society. All of these potentially provide supports that uh, can um, surround the young person and sort of guide them on this journey from childhood towards adulthood. Uh, Diana Baumrind, uh, a researcher from California, came up with these different parenting concepts or ideas back in the 1960s, I think it was. And she identified two key dimensions of parenting. One is demandingness, the other is responsiveness. So responsiveness is the nice, fun, pleasant, more pleasant side of parenting, which is about the empathy and communication and understanding and warmth in the relationship. Demandingness is maybe the tougher side of parenting, uh, which is about having high expectation, 
having rules um, and having some consequences. And authoritative parenting, which is up in the top right hand corner there, that is the style of parenting that's associated with the best outcomes for uh, children and adolescents, which is both high on responsiveness and high on demandingness. Um, for those of you who are maybe born in the 60s or 70s, you might remember the Little House of the Prairie. It was uh, it was one of the biggest programs on television, I guess, in the 70s. And you know, there's two of the characters from that, and they had two very different families. There's Laura Ingalls, Nellie Olson. Um, one was massively spoilt and indulged. The other had the parents, I guess, who demonstrated that authoritative style, warm and loving, but ultimately having significant expectations of their children as well. And I suppose the two characters were very different. Um, the, uh, the developmental assets emphasizes the role of, of parents as well um, as role models. So how we use substances and I know the focus of today is on cannabis use but if you as a parent or we as parents are trying to exert influence on our teenagers and they say well you're pouring a bottle of wine into yourself every night it, it will undermine your ability to uh, exert influence because your son may well decide you're just uh, you're um, modeling just the use of a different psychoactive drug um, so what we do ourselves does matter I drink myself, so um, maybe it's a question of how we drink and, and monitoring our own relationship with, with whatever substance use we do engage in. Um, and also be mindful of the fact that you might have older kids at home. You might be worried about your 15 or 16 year old, but if there's a 22 or a 24 year old who's, um, you know, again, pouring half a bottle of vodka into himself before he goes out on a Saturday night, once again, that, that, that models something that's probably ultimately unhealthy. So the the, the recommendation will be that in homes, it should be that no one engages in a in harmful substance use or substance use that's associated with risk. Uh, another point, I guess, for parents is, you know, not to engage in war stories about your own adventures during your adolescent years, which involved intoxication or drug use, because that can only serve or may serve just to normalize that behavior or build an expectation in your teenagers that this is actually just something that everyone does. And if you as a parent survived it, well, they might too. So even though you might have had some adventures in your adolescence yourself that you managed to survive and get away with, they're probably not conversations to have uh, in or around your, your teenagers. It's important as well to remember uh, who or what influences teenagers. And what this slide here demonstrates is that um, influences from all fronts actually tends to diminish as kids move from childhood towards early adulthood. They care less actually about their friends, less about their teachers. Uh, but at all phases, parents are actually the biggest single influence. Um, and that may come as a surprise again, um, but the research is pretty consistent on this and it's UK based and it's focused on alcohol, but I'm pretty convinced that this is the case internationally. Uh, that when push comes to shove, parents, kids know we're the people who are there in, in their corners. We're, we'll be there if, if, if things get tough. Uh, hence, they do value our opinions. They might not sort of verbalize that to us so often, but the research seems to bear it out. So with regard to uh, alcohol and drug use, I suppose my advice to parents is to really uh, work as a team. It's important that mum and dad are on the same page on this issue. Uh, get knowledgeable, which is part of the reason why perhaps why people are attending today. Know what the risks are. You do, there's no point how it going in scaremongering or, or having a, an over the top uh, view of risks. Be factual, be clear, and have a united front as a mum and dad together. Um, I'm just going to go on, on, on from that. Um, perhaps it's a bigger issue in Ireland, um, but you know the, this dilemma that parents have: will I let my son or daughter drink or not? Um, certainly, my advice generally is to delay permission or do not give permission for any substance use for young people. Does that eliminate use? No, it doesn't. Uh, absolutely not. But uh, what seems to happen is where permission is given. Uh, that seems to cause young, those young people who are given permission to give themselves permission to use even more uh, of whatever substance they've been given permission to use than their friends who have been di denied that permission. Doesn't mean that you know that the rule uh, is 100% effective. It absolutely isn't. 
for me, once again, it has a dampening effect on uh, the young person's journey into substance use. Um, and then I haven't decided as mum and dad together what you think is acceptable or reasonable, it's then important to have a conversation around it with your son or daughter, being clear what your expectations are, being clear that you want them to have you know, rich, fulfilling, happy teenage years, you want them to have a fun and interesting social life, uh, and you will give them freedom and autonomy, and if they use that well, you'll give them more. But if they make really bad decisions with it, you will rein in the freedoms that you've granted them. That's what authoritative parenting is. Um, and, you know, where young people stick to the rules and stick to the expectations is not easy. It's important that that's noted and affirmed. And if they fall short of those rules and standards, I'm not a big fan of, of massive big sanctions and punishments or being grounded for six months or anything horrendous like that. It's more relentlessly communicating that they've fallen short of what the expectation is and some minor sanction is imposed. Maybe your pocket money is cut in half for a week or you have to come home an hour earlier from the party the next time. It's been given an unambiguous message to your sons and daughters that what you expect. Um, so I, I thought I'd mention this issue of context. There really is this massive movement towards uh, legalization, drug normalization, and that's very well funded by some tremendously wealthy people and big corporations. And it's tough against that backdrop to uh, calmly parent this issue or to be a, a voice that, that, that counters that, that cannabis is harmless narrative. Um, and what we've seen certainly in Ireland is that the perceptions of risk of cannabis, um, uh, which had been increasing, there was less and less people actually viewed cannabis as, as uh, being low risk. Uh, that sort of surged upwards, uh, unfortunately, in the last decade. And that's coincided with increased use and increased harm. Um, okay, so uh, part of what makes that challenging, I suppose, is that. Um, or um, society or elements within society are saying one thing about cannabis while we as parents might, might hold a very different view and it's tough for teenagers to, to figure out what's going on there and that's very different to tobacco I think part of the huge success in suppressing tobacco use amongst adolescents is that there is one single message which kids get from pretty much every front which is that uh, cigarette use is, is risky um, it's bad for you. And kids are not on a mission of self-destruction where they get clear messages, uh, clear information, and most of them will make the healthy choice most of the time. Um, within treatment, I'm not going to be able to talk about this for too much because I'm conscious of time, Laura, sorry. Um, we do see that we get better outcomes where we have more parental involvement. And, and that's not just us noticing that, that's actually borne out by international research. So in the treatment process, parents are very central to that. And we have a family therapist on the team who work with the family. Um, I've already mentioned that issue of the emotions, I suppose, that parents can arrive into the service with, this mix of shame, blame, anger, and this issue potentially even of grief at, at the the lost child, and I mean the child lost to addiction, uh, who's become someone or is on a journey that they never imagined uh, would occur for them. I've talked before about the unified parental approach uh, as prevention, but it's equally important where parents are separated. So where parents are separated, um, you know, we try and get them to co-parent so that once again, they're on the same page in terms of support and expectations. <coughs> ACRA is the, the, one of the treatment models that we use, which is the stands for the Adolescent Community Reinforcement Approach. And that has specific advice for parents. So it encourages parents, a little bit like the prevention message, to look at your own substance use and reduce and curtail it and make that clear to your teenagers that you are making change too, because that can uh, spur them on to, to consider making change as well. To really work on positive communication. Um, to then the, the, the other side of parenting uh, is to, you know, to, to understand where your teenager is, um, get a better sense of their friends, their friendship group, their movement, um, um, and finally they're supposed to really support their participation in pro-social activities. That involves like sports and hobbies and interests to very actively step in to support that. Um, 
So I mentioned this issue of, of, of violence and aggression within the home, which is why we've, we've, we've begun using the nonviolent resistance approach. And it's a really good template together and is very consistent with the ACRA approach because you know, it's not, it's, it's okay, in, in a, it, it looks at some tools and strategies to deal with aggression, but ultimately what it's trying to do is rebuild connection, rebuild relationship between parent and teenager, so aggression is less likely to occur in the first place. Um, so in conclusion, uh, I like this idea of viewing teenagers as apprentice adults. As they become more competent and capable, we loosen the reins and give them more autonomy and that allows them to learn more and, and experience more. Uh, but where they're making poor choices with that autonomy, we have we rein that in. Uh, cannabis use invites lots and lots of different risks into the lives of teenagers and hence is, is best avoided. Uh, parents are, for me, the biggest single influence. There's lots of things influence what our teenagers do and don't do, but parents are the biggest single influence. So to retain optimism in your power to exert some influence on change. So the issue of optimism is really important, not just within families, but also at a societal level. Um, and, um, you know, I suppose the, a theme that's relevant to both prevention and uh, support in terms of treatment is, is that uh, our job as parents is to try to find that, 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 that position whereby we're working on connection, we're working on relationship, we're working on empathy and emotional understanding with our kids while also having expectations uh, and rules. Uh, and we're looking to have both together. So that's my uh, talk there, Laura. Okay, wonderful. Let's see if we can uh, put you back on uh, the screen. If you want to try your webcam again, there we okay. go. I took the slides down so that we can uh, save bandwidth since you're coming to us from so far away. And uh, thank you so much for all this, uh, all these great strategies. We just have about five minutes and we do have some questions. I just wish I would have known these strategies myself uh, a good a good 10 years ago. I especially loved what you said about kids are not on a path to purposeful self-destruction, that they need clear messaging oh. and explanation. And I think uh, so many parents that at least the ones I've talked with, they give away too much authority, too much permission, too much autonomy. Um, you know, when the child turns 16 and they can drive, it's it's very hard to keep tracks on their whereabouts. We tried with a, a tracker on his phone. Uh, he wasn't real thrilled about that, but those types of things yeah. I think are very critical. Um, let's see, are, if you'll take some questions. First one is, do you agree or would you agree that prevention is easier when a drug is illegal? Um. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that prevention is easier when a drug is illegal. There's uh, there's there's less access. Um, it's less normalised. Um, there's a, a clearer message of disapproval, not just within a family, but across society. So, yeah, um, there's no other explanation for me as to why the rates of alcohol use are so high, so much higher than the rates of illegal drug use. Um, it has to, for me, it comes down to legal yeah i think that is important to state that clearly so thank you for that uh how much does genetics play in cannabis use disorder related psychoses do you have uh, any input on that question um so mary cannon i think probably would have touched on that a little bit in her talk a couple of weeks ago um That's, there yeah. is an yeah, genes certainly are a risk factor for psychosis. Uh, obviously, we can't change our genes, and um, they are what they are. Uh, cannabis is a, seems to be an independent risk factor as well, and that's an environmental risk factor, and that's something we can we can change. It's a bit like you know, different ethnic groups have got different risk factors for um, sun-related skin cancers. Um, it's down to your genetics, but the message for everyone is you know, be careful and don't get sunburned. Um, I, for me, it's you know well, we can't change our genes. We can change the, the the environmental risk factors. Cannabis is an environmental risk factor, hence um, best avoided, particularly if there's a family history of uh, psychotic disorders. That's a great analogy. Really like that about sunburn. 
Uh, let's see, does Ireland have a drug court program whereby those apprehended with an illegal drug are required to attend drug education, drug treatment, and participate in community service in order to avoid a criminal record? What What is the, the status there? Um, there certainly was a drug court. I'm not 100% sure if it's still in action. It was very much focused on heroin addiction. Uh, Dublin had a huge heroin problem back in the 1990s. Um, heroin use is largely, and opioid use is largely eliminated from adolescence at this stage, which is great. Um, our courts are pretty, even outside of, of special dedicated drug courts, uh, judges tend to take a very sympathetic view towards someone who's in front of them where their offending behaviour is deemed to be related to alcohol or drug use if they're seen to address that alcohol or drug use. And we'll often strike out charges if uh, people are, are cooperating with a treatment program. Trying to get help, okay. Uh, if we know our son is smoking cannabis, how do you recommend we respond? Zero tolerance or other methods? Um, so I'm inclined to go back to drinking again. It seems like if I knew my son was drinking, uh, what would I do? Um, and I suppose it's about being clear with your son, I think. Uh, even if you didn't have the conversation before he started smoking cannabis, that you think this is a really bad idea and it's, it's not something you're comfortable with, it's not something you can permit. Um, and, you know, to consider using, to, to demonstrate, I suppose, your 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 annoyance with this or, or your worry around it, because it's not, it's not a, we want to control our kids' lives, we just want them to live ha healthy, happy, productive lives. And our, the reason we worry about this is because of the health risks that potentially consider using some consequence as in your pocket money is going to be cut by 20% or something, you know, while you choose to do this. Um, but really explain that you're coming from a position of, of concern about health, uh, which is uh, which is what it's about. So um, that's, that's, yeah, I suppose that's, that's the advice there. Um, yeah, it's difficult. But really working on we really yes. work on trying to retain connection as well and that every conversation should be about cannabis use it's just i'm really disappointed that you've made this decision to use cannabis and i'm responding in this way now what are we having for dinner or you know now let's go and do something fun together you know to, to do what you can to try and uh, really embed their connection into pro-social other positive activities to maximize the likelihood that it doesn't sort of spiral out of control okay uh it seems that this great information isn't available until a son or daughter gets in trouble with drugs and or dies from an overdose or suicide. We seem to lack education and how to get better income outcomes, how to get better outcomes. We think we are influencing our children positively, but we need to understand them and help them along the journey. That's a comment. Um, let's see. How much does the influence of money contributing to marijuana acceptance in Europe? In the US alone, um, so much of the money control is, or the control is out of our, of our uh, the decision is out of our control. So there's a lot of, you know, people profiting here in the yeah. US uh, off um, of marijuana. Yeah, like there's, there's uh, some of your, some of your billionaires are currently funding the cannabis legalization agenda here in Europe as well. Uh, uh, so uh, money is certainly driving it and it's certainly going to generate lots of money. So it's going to make some rich people richer. Um, I suppose part of my desire to prevent that industry from betting itself into places like Ireland or, or Europe mm -hmm. is the experience with alcohol. The alcohol industry has an unbelievably powerful lobby they are the dominant influence over alcohol policy and our society pays a huge price for that in terms of health related harms. I'm convinced that if we get the cannabis industry in here, they will become the dominant voice dictating and determining cannabis policy, as I think is the case in the United States. It's not been led by public health, it's been led by, by economics and finance and that's never a good recipe if you're worried about people's health. Agreed, and the lobbyists and the industry in general. Uh, okay, we have just a couple more questions. We are at the end of our time. Can you reverse the negative impact 
of cannabis use on the developing brain? And if so, how long does that take? Um, I suppose the short answer to that is probably yes. Uh, I, I think so, but we're not 100% sure. Uh, I suppose even the research which is demonstrating that that harm um, and those changes, uh, you know, we're only learning about. There's a massive big study, the ABCD study in the United States, where they're following up thousands of kids over a period nice. of many years. We'll hopefully answer that more clearly. We're hoping. But the understanding would be that, yeah, these changes, um, if you stop uh, bombarding the brain with, with, with THC or whatever drug is causing the impact, it does it does normalize over a period of time, but probably for most people and maybe not a hundred percent. Would be my 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 guess in terms of what the research will show, but that's just a, an educated guess. Yes, I've heard along the same that uh, in some, if it's caught early, that you know my son recovered after four months of abstinence and would have been okay, but unfortunately yeah. went uh, back to it and after repeated. Uh, cannabis induced psychotic events, um, then it did not reverse um, and turned into more of, you know, the schizo schizophrenia eventually. Yeah. Um, but I've heard in some cases it can take six to 12, 14, 16 months for the brain to to stabilize and even needing, you know, in our case, antipsychotics to to help with some of the psychosis yeah. um, that came along with it. But there's hope. We always want to give hope that we. We certainly hope that it it does, but in some it, it it will not. Well, that unfortunately is the end of our time. There are a few more questions. I will follow up with everyone who is registered for this seminar in email and copy in Dr. Smith so that you can ask him any remaining um, questions that you do have. Thank you all uh, for joining us, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much for the gift of your time, talent, and wisdom. We are so grateful for you being one of Johnny's ambassadors. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.